What's up everybody, thanks for joining us here today on the VSO Gun Channel. Uh, there's a lot of happenings going on in the firearms industry these days as far as like legal concerns and there's been lots of, um, lots of articles written that I've been uh, kind of trying to keep up on and I've been mostly silent on them over the course of the last couple of weeks because I knew that I was coming here to film with my friend Derek uh, with Munitions Law Group. Uh, if you guys don't know, uh, we do some work with them. We, uh, he has his own YouTube channel as well that uh, kind of digs into legal issues and questions from the audience and things like that. So if you guys aren't subscribed to Derek, make sure that you go over there. I'll have a link in the description box down below. But while we were here, I thought we could use Derek's exceptionally large brain yeah. to talk about, about the uh, <laughs> to talk about some of these things that are kind of swirling around the bull right now. All right. So um, first, uh, good news out of Ohio, two particular instances where mm -hmm. we have an affirmative good news and then a potential good news. So if you want to, if you want to hop into, so I, I'm not sure how you categorize this, which one you're referring to, but there is some potential good news. The general assembly has passed a program bill. Um, the governor has indicated he's going to veto that pro-gun bill, uh, but I, you know, it could be that we can get around the veto. You know, we, we could override that veto. I mean, concealed carry got passed on an override of Governor Taft's veto. So it could happen again. Uh, the numbers I'm seeing, the information I have, it's looking pretty optimistic. If he doesn't uh, veto it, there, there's a chance it could still pass. Uh, I think it would likely pass if he didn't you know, espouse a veto. Uh, so we do have a pro-gun bill in the General Assembly right now that looks like it's going to pass. So. The other Ohio issue you're referring to? Uh, the case that the ATF oh, lost. Oh, right, yes. Uh, U.S. versus, and I can't remember the name of the defendant off the top of my head, but Northern Ohio, District Northern Ohio. It wasn't my case. I wish it was, but it wasn't. The attorneys did a wonderful job on it. The expert witness for that case actually is an expert witness we use quite a bit. Rick Vasquez is the former uh, acting director of the firearms technology branch, and he was uh, flown in to, to testify against the government's expert as to whether or not a, uh, a, a essentially, I don't want to call it an SBR because that was the whole argument. Was this rifle, well, was it a rifle? And if it was a rifle, was it an SBR? And you get into the uh, hyper technical language of the National Firearms Act and, and our, our, our position, I guess, the pro gun position or Rick Vasquez's position and the defendant's position was it was not. They were following all the, the previous known regulations that the ATF has, has promulgated, all the previous opinions as to whether or not like a cheek rest was considered a stock, right? And if there was no cheek rest and it was a handgun, whether or not the angled foregrip became a vertical foregrip, things like that. And, and I haven't dug into the case, I wasn't there from the beginning, but I've read the pleadings I can most of them, because most of the case is sealed. And from what I can tell, they were going back on what they had said before, which is a scary thing. I mean, think about that. The ETF tells you you can do something, then you can do something else, you do something else and they prosecute you for it. We've never seen that before. There's actually a legal theory, a defense legal theory, and I don't know if it was argued, but entrapment by estoppel, I always get those mixed up, or estoppel by entrapment. I think it's entrapment by estoppel. But basically, if a government agency tells you you can do something, you do, it turns out to be illegal, they are stopped from, from prosecuting you. They're, entra you know, they're, they're basically entrapping you, if you will. Uh, I don't know how that was utilized or if it was utilized. But nevertheless, the point is, is the, the way it's been uh, advertised to us, at least, the inf from the information we have gleaned, is that the ATF has gone back on previous opinions. I don't know how true that is. I haven't done an analysis or anything, but that's what it appears to be. So the uh, gentleman won. He won his case. So he's not looking at 10 years in prison or whatever. But it was touted across like gun media as, as, this, um, as this major victory for the, the um, or, or hamstringing of the National Firearms Act type thing. Um, what are your kind of opinions? I have mine, mm -hmm. but I kind of see it as like a maintenance of the status quo more than anything else. Yeah, I don't think it changed a whole lot in the industry. Uh, again, I don't know the hyper-technical details of the case. I haven't really dug into them, but from my overview of it, I don't think it's going to change a lot in our day-to-day -day lives of uh, as being NFA owners by any means. It does make me a little concerned that if the ATF is changing uh, their tune on previous regulations and not notifying the industry before they enforce it, that to me strikes me as very un-American and very scary. I'm not saying that's what's going on, but if it is, that, that is a scary thing because how are we supposed to make sure that we're legal if we don't know the law or don't have it available to us or how it's being enforced? Because typically that's how it happens. When they come out with a major decision or on something like mm -hmm. that, usually they 
submit it to industry professionals yeah, normally, to, yeah. to weigh in on it and see yeah. how it's going to affect business broadly and then yeah I mean I've read some different articles out there and again it's 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 all anecdotal at best but you know that the ETF the DOJ has changed how the ETF is is being utilized after the Vegas shooting I don't know if there's any truth to that but uh, we have noticed as attorneys that there uh, seems to be, uh, and that's normal, but a change in winds as the pol policies and politics change at the White House too. So we'll see how it fleshes out. Speaking of seeing how things fleshes out, House 7115. I believe that's the number, yeah. What's going on here, man? Well, it's just, again, uh, I, I did a video on this, and as I, I told my YouTube audience, elections have consequences. I mean, I know that's not my, like, I can't take credit for that statement, <laughs> but I like using it. Uh, but they do have consequences. Like, look, Democrats took the House, they feel emboldened, they feel empowered. They have made gun control a platform of the National Party. Now think about that. When Obama ran for office, he was out shooting a shot, well, allegedly shooting a shotgun, right? Maybe not very well, but he... Yeah, I was about to say, that's where we're going. He was courting, he was co courting the hunting community and the gun community. Uh, Hillary Clinton ran for office, there was none of that. There was just lambasting and there was just... Uh, derogatory remarks and just we hate gun owners now it's gotten bad and it's getting worse and that's scary because the Second Amendment used to be a pretty moderate view for a lot of Democrats it was a down the that's what one of the more Republican or the conservative views that the blue dog Democrats have you don't see that anymore very few of that they pretty much kicked all those right people out. so they they dropped this bill we call what we say dropping and uh, I don't think it's gonna go anywhere It has no chance of winning uh, but what it basically does is two things one it regulates uh, AR-15 parts kits, so if anybody's doing build parties out there, if it passed, they would no longer be able to do that. Uh, and 80% lowers are what they put in the law, I think they call them blanks, if I remember correctly. Uh, those would become illegal or, 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 or not, not allowed to be advertised and sold, at least as a non-firearm. Yeah, like, and, that's, and that's an important distinction too. Like, you, not only can you not make them anymore, but you're not even allowed to talk about them existing for sale. Essentially, that's correct, yeah. for business purposes, at least the way I read the law. The second thing it does, I think, is actually a little more disconcerting that the media hasn't really picked up on the gun community. At least they haven't really focused on it. And that's the requirement if I make my own firearm at home, I have to serialize the number, or the, the gun. And it's not like I just choose a serial number. I have to go to an FFL and get a serial number, and for which the law doesn't flesh out how they're going to generate the serial numbers, who's going to keep track of them. You know, there, there's a whole... Uh, infrastructure there that they haven't really designed. And we all know what that means though. That means that it's probably going to be ceded to the ATF sure. to basically say, here's your baby, right? build it. Right. It's just, you know, I'm, you can say I sound like a kook or a right wing nut or whatever, but look, at the end of the day, why do you need to have sequential serial numbering of firearms that are being made on every gun? There's one reason, one reason only that I can think of for homemade firearms. And that's to track, to track those guns. You can say what you want, but it's just the start to the inevitable. I think Communist Lenin once said that the perfect device to deny gun ownership to the bourgeois was a system of licensing and registration. And that's just another step in that direction. It's scary, in my it opinion. Is. So. It is. So, some good stuff going, some bad stuff going. Forces are moving. Guys, it's really important that uh, you guys are politically involved yep. and, is, uh, and are up on all these issues. So I hope that this kind of uh, shed some light on some of the things that are going on around the gun community right now. Uh, as I said at the beginning of the video, make sure that you hop over uh, to Munitions Law Group, check out Derek and his channel, uh, and also if you have any legal concerns, yeah, yeah I mean, there are yeah. 50 state, you know. Most federal issues across the country, uh, as far as state issues, we can bring in local counsel across the country, but we have uh, solid uh, holes on Ohio, Kentucky, and Georgia right now from a state issue standpoint. Absolutely. Well, anyway. Buddy, thank you for Appreciate joining us here today. Thank you. Thanks for uh, informing the audience, if you will. So thanks for watching the BSO Gun Channel. Hopefully we'll see you guys on a future video. If you guys like this type of content, definitely tell us down below. If you have any questions uh, for Derek, uh, either leave a comment on his channel over there, or you can also ask them in the comment section down below, and we'll see if we can't get those. Uh, I might know an inside guy that maybe could get those questions asked over on his channel, uh, maybe a later <laughs> day. So.